All right, so let's get started. Don't have any viewers yet, but that's fine. It's only one minute in. We'll see how long it takes. Just waiting for questions. A very exciting first two minutes. Remember, I can't see any questions you put in the uh, streaming portion. You had to do them through social media, although I think I found out how to get around that when setting up for uh, this evening. So maybe we can try and work around that next time. So that way, I know there are a few of you who will probably be viewing on your phone, and then you got to leave the stream to go to social media to post a question and hurry up and come back. So, you know. Remember, it's M R N O R T O N 3 4. I got views, but I don't have a single question yet. Don't send me a direct message. Just do an Amanda mention. Okay, so getting through the uh, through the message request, I'll go through that since I can see them anyways. Um, so the first one is what an economic system is. So the economic system is basically we talked about there are three questions that scarcity leads to. Of course, those three questions are, you know, what is going to be produced, how are we going to produce it, and who is it going to be produced for? Well, societies, you know, they solve these. They solve these, uh, how to answer these questions by creating economic systems. So we covered three types of economic systems, and those were uh, command economy, market economy, and then we also talked about traditional economy. But, you know, to, to elaborate more on that, keep in mind there there isn't a pure market economy out there anymore. There's not a pure command economy out there anymore. And there's not a pure traditional economy really out there anymore either, at least in the major developed world. We're, we're worlds, countries. Um, they're all mixed. You look at the United States, a lot of people like to say market economy, but we still have aspects of command economy in it. Things that we talk about like social security, that's a command economy feature. Um, you look at um, uh, the Affordable Care Act and some of the things it does through there, that's also um, uh, part of command economy. Any public good or service um, that's available is part of the command economy. So. That'll be that. Uh, it's Marquez's question. Um, and I got another question. Is, can you describe a cost benefit analysis? So those are the things that it's basically what helps you make a decision. That's when we talked about the the activities in your textbook when it has you look at the Max's decision making grid. So it's basically laying out what, you know, if I make this decision, what's it going to cost me? So what's the opportunity cost? And then you'll also figure out, well, what's my benefit from doing that? So um, I'm sure that none of you, including myself, probably sit there and just draw out a grid and go, oh, here's what, I, if I make this decision, this is what it'll cost me. But realistically, you probably do those things inside of your head anytime you make a decision. 
it's like, oh, like like right now, you you have opportunity cost and you've made a decision for those of you that are viewing, the, the whole five of you right now. Um, you had to make a decision. You could have been doing something else other than sitting here watching and participating in this review. So, you know, whatever the next best choice would have been. So let's say, hmm, Mr. Norton's review or play some 2K. Well, 2K would be your opportunity cost. And just to keep in mind, too, opportunity cost is only the next best thing. If it was, you know, my choices were play 2K or go shopping or go whatever, whatever, only what is your next best choice is actually uh, what opportunity cost is. Let's see. A centrally planned, centrally planned economy functions, that's your command economy. So centrally planned, when we talk about central planning, that's really just the government running it. Um, we talked about some of the weaknesses, too, that are associated with a command economy. Um, a lot of the, and with a central economy, is a lot of the needs of the local communities are not really taken into account. And they don't really know really what your needs are. So th it's not very efficient. They make a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, there are some advantages, too, that we discussed, is that everybody gets taken care of. Um, We've also talked about how some things that might not be profitable um, but are needed uh, will still be made where in a market economy that wouldn't actually occur because in a market economy, who really wants to start a business that doesn't make any profit? Um, so those are some of those, uh, how they work. Uh, there are some other aspects of you know command economies too. It doesn't have to be wholesale, but you know, some of the things we talked about is um, France has a little bit of command economy to it, like obviously more than the United States because the United States doesn't really own too, it doesn't have too much in terms of the government owning businesses. Um, there are a few though, uh, the U S mail that's owned by the, uh, the U S government. And if you didn't know, Amtrak is actually owned by the U S government too. So those are some public goods and services that you might've not been familiar with. So, um, do, do, do. And I'm thinking I'm already out of questions. Hopefully we get some more. It's not exactly shocking that I only got five, now six people viewing. I kind of figured I'd have less tonight anyways, because in years past, when I did this, there were no review videos that were posted. So, I mean, really, you could have probably had most of, if not all, your questions answered by reviewing those. Four factors of production, sure, that's land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship would be the first one we can talk about. Entrepreneurship is essentially just the idea of uh, in planning to make a business. So like, for example, it, any business you own so or, or look at, um, think of anything. Let's look at Burks. You guys buy your uniforms from Burks. Um, somebody had to think of the idea of putting that business together. So that would be considered entrepreneurship. Ford Motor Company. So Henry Ford had to have this vision of putting a, motor, a, a automobile company together. Um, the, I'm wearing a Ralph Lauren uh, golf shirt. So that designer uh, obviously came up with some idea in order to make clothing. So that's pretty much entrepreneurship. Then we have labor. That's pretty much any physical. Um, that's any. What is this? Okay. That's any physical uh, labor that's actually done for it. So like um, the labor would be, let's take this shirt, you know, um, all the the people who work to actually stitch it together, or even use the machinery. The thing that, um, the thing that uh, students oftentimes don't pick up on though with labor is it also goes with the mental planning. So if we're talking about labor for this shirt, the stitching that put the patch on and, and thought of, it's also, and put the buttons on, it also is considered the planning, the thinking of the design that this shirt is. So whoever sat there and thought, you know what, I'm going to put blue and red stripes and put USA on the collar. It's only going to be two buttons. One, I got two right here. I'm going to put a patch right here. I'm going to put a USA right here. And I got an American flag on the back of my neck. So that's all considered labor too because the, the planning out stages. And then we have capital, capital goods. And, um, so that goes to like machinery. If you remember in the, um, the, uh, Econoland game, the capital goods, um, that just basically had a picture of a machine, but it's more than that too. Sometimes people consider ca uh, workers capital, not the work they do, but the workers themselves. Um, it would also be like the trucks to transport goods, uh, your products. It would also be, um, 
the factory that you are are uh, are using to uh, to build all of the products that you have. So uh, that would be capital. And then we have um, natural resources or land is also you know what it was also called. That's just any natural resources that are are used in the production uh, of the of the products. So there's your four. I think I got them: land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Yep. All right. Let's see the next one. Um, <laughs> Mr. Washington said, said, asked me to say all of the learning targets within the packet. Guess what? I don't have a copy in front of me, and uh, I'm gonna tell you on that one. So, <laughs> let's put it this way: if you don't, if you don't know, uh, if you don't know the whole learning target packet you are in trouble for tomorrow i would just suggest that uh you do the best you can um let's try another one can i go over marxism sure uh marxism i know i'm gonna get the next one too so um and someone says i don't see a live video i'm lost that's sad i don't know how to get you to where it's at eh, hold on let me respond to them real quick mm. Well, Krishnaity did. Oh, thanks, Krishnaity. We're getting back to Marxism. So Marxism is basically communism. I know none of you take, excuse me, with the exception of three people in economics for me this year, four people, because it's, yeah, I'm not going to say who they are, but anyway, um, you have no idea that Marxism is probably associated with communism, but Karl Marx, which is a, t a page within your textbook, is the f founder, him and... Uh, why I'm drawing a blank on the other guy it doesn't matter anyways. Um, now it's gonna drive me crazy to try and think of his name. It, oh well, um, basically came up with this this ideology of communism. And so what he sees is he's alive during the uh, industrial the first industrial revolution, and um, he basically sees the the bourgeoisie, which you're like, what is the bourgeoisie? The bourgeoisie is just the wealthy people of. Uh, of of the time uh, there was always distinctions it was uh bourgeoisie where rich people that didn't have noble status and now you're i'm just probably totally losing you but um so basically what he notices is that the the living conditions for the working class are basically staying the same or in some cases he believes they're getting worse and he basically refers to them as wage slaves because it's the bourgeoisie who keeps getting more wealthy and keeps having their standard of living increase. And according to him, as we just mentioned, uh, you don't have this uh, you don't have this increased standard of living for the uh, for the working class. So his opinion is that all of history is a just a, a big story of class struggle. It used to be between the the bourgeoisie and the nobility, and then the bourgeoisie would win out. And now it's a class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the working class, or what he referred to as the proletariat. Um, so according to him, though, as well, is that um, whoever is in power is going to make laws favoring that particular group. And it, it makes sense. There's some sound reasons behind that. Um, so his opinion was, you're going to have to have a violent overthrow, a violent revolution of the working class to overthrow the uh, the bourgeoisie. And then what would happen is, is his goal is he wants to have a classless society where everyone is equal. And the only way you can do that is to allow the government to basically take over all private property and private ownership. And since we talked about communism and how it's an extreme version of command economy, you should be able to pick up on how Marxism is communism and how it's associated with a command economy. So you should be good for that. Um, so the next one says explain communism, socialism, democratic socialism. So I pretty much just did do um, communism. Um, I talked about it in class as well, just like saying, hey, just think of uh, of uh, socialism on steroids. Um, so I kind of explained it too. The other thing as well is that socialism and communism tend to be uh, put in place through violence. And this is how it's different than democratic socialism. Is, de is democratic socialism is this idea that I can get socialist type policies passed 
but I don't have to use violence for it. I use the democratic process. And you have uh, you have Bernie Sanders was running as a democratic socialist. He claims he is one. He has no problems claiming that. Um, you can see things within our government that we have right now that would be considered passed by democratic socialism because we didn't have any sort of violent uprising or civil war, things like social security, things like welfare programs, things like, well, like schooling, th what you have right now, those are all considered forms of democratic socialism. So, all right, let's see. Uh, Trade-offs and opportunity uh, costs factor into the decision-making process. Okay, so trade-offs and, and opportunity cost, you know, I had some students come up to me today and, and they were confused on that, and I understand. Um, so trade-off is pretty much when we're talking about not all or nothing things. So the way that, but there's still opportunity costs involved. This is where this gets a little confusing. So trade-off would be like if I have 10 hours to do something and I can only choose one thing. It's like, um, I'll give you another example. The one I used in class, I've got $5. I've got two choices I can make. I can make well, whatever I choose to eat in this particular case. So let's say I went to McDonald's. So that's my choice. I really wouldn't choose McDonald's. Gross. I still eat McDonald's, but you know it's not my first choice. Um, so my when we go back with opportunity cost. Remember, it's the next best thing. So maybe the next best thing I would have, like if I couldn't have McDonald's, maybe I'd have Checkers. So then Checkers becomes my opportunity cost. Um, and then, you know, I could have had Wendy's, I could have had Taco Bell, I could have had Hardee's, any of those things. Though, remember, the, the ones that come after checkers because they were not the next best thing that's not considered opportunity cost. But trade-off might work like this, too. Let's say I have $10. And maybe I spend $5 on McDonald's, and then I spend $5 on checkers. Well, I did make a trade-off because it wasn't all or nothing. But there's still some opportunity cost involved there because when I spend five dollars at mcdonald's i'm missing out on five more dollars i could have spent at checkers so that's going to be how trade-offs and opportunity costs are associated with each other now with opportunity costs you know you got to sit there and think is it worth it and a lot of times they have i get this stupid light in the background i'm not gonna be able to do anything a student last year always complained about it a lot um you know, you have to sit there and think, is what I'm giving up really worth it? And that's how it gets factored in the decision-making grid. So, you know, some people think, well, man, you know, I could have $10 worth of McDonald's or, you know, I could split that in half and uh, maybe be okay. You know, your textbook's talking about trade-offs, like, you know, with opportunity costs and trade-offs. I think the, the example was the guy can either work or go on vacation. So, um, like for two weeks and, so, you know, if he goes on vacation, he gets the benefit of having all this leisure time, but then the opportunity cost is he doesn't go to work and he doesn't make any money. And then they flipped that in the book. They said, well, if he decides to work for two weeks, he gets the benefit of having the money, but the opportunity cost is he misses out on the fun for his vacation. So then they give something like, yeah, you know, I'm paraphrasing, like, well, he gets a trade off. He's going to work for one week and then he's going to go on vacation for one week. So he's not losing out on everything. There's still opportunity costs involved there. So, um, traditional economies and the strength and weaknesses in it. Sion says, Can I turn my learning target packet in at the end of the day? I don't know why you would need to the end of the day since I gave it to you yesterday, and the deadline is before you take your test. Do you have any questions about the test rather than this learning target packet? See, the nice thing is when we get our Google accounts, which I didn't tell all my classes, that's going to be Friday, a week from tomorrow. I don't even have to hand out papers. I just have to put it on Google Classroom, and you can lose it 50 times as long as you're willing to print it out each time. Let me go back to strength and weaknesses in the traditional economy. So the strength is that everybody knows their role. Well, men, I mean, just giving you some examples. Examples: Men always do this. Women might always do that. Um, everybody knows what it is. The weakness, though, is that if men always do men things, I'm sure there's probably a few girls that can do things better than men do, like manly things. And there's probably a few men that can do you know, womenly things better than women can do. 
this is in a traditional economy in the way that it's presented in your textbook is that you would never have the opportunity to go ahead and do what you're best at. And that leads us to an economic term, vocabulary term that we had focused on, is it doesn't allow for specialization. Remember, specialization is focusing on doing something that you do best. Now, when we talk about it in the real world sense, you know, what I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say I'm the greatest teacher in the world or anything, and some of you are probably laughing and spitting out pop or whatever it is that you have in your mouth right now for me to even suggest that I'm even close. But of all the things that I'm good at, this is what I can make the most money at. You know, I'm probably a better you know, video game player than I am in probably really like, yeah, okay, but yeah, I'm okay. I'm probably a better video game player than I am teacher. I know I'm a better baseball coach than I am a teacher. So I'm, a, I'm just going to, I don't care. I'm a pretty good baseball coach in my opinion. But I can't make as much money doing those things. So I chose to specialize in teaching because that's where I can make the most money in as far as my skill set. Um, let's see. So that would be your strengths and weaknesses. Oh, some other things too, some weaknesses. They're very hesitant to change because they're stuck in traditions. So they're not very, um, they're not very efficient. Another strength too, is that we always know what the, uh, answer to the questions for, uh, what scarcity leads to. So the answer is always the same. You know, what are we going to make? Whatever ensures survival. How are we going to make it? Well, same thing. Whatever ensures survival. And who are we going to make it for? <clears throat> and yes, it's it's the same answer again. Whatever ensures survival. Uh, so someone says, central planned economy is just people making choices for the government. No, it's actually the other way around. It's the government making choices for the people. The government decides. So let's go back. We're going to do that same question. Same three questions from a command economy or centrally planned economy. All right, so you ready? What's going to be made? Whatever the government tells you is going to be made. How's it going to be made? However the government tells you to make it. Who's, who's going to be made for? Whoever the government tells you it's going to be made for. And sometimes people lose out. You know, make the joke to the t-shirt that I fell in love with and just I have to find a way to buy it. It has a picture of Joseph Stalin on it. And you're like, probably who? Well, he was the leader of communist Russia throughout the running around the 1920s to 40s, basically 1920-ish, late 1920s through the end of World War II and a little bit beyond that. But, you know, he communism was a command economy. And, and this, this why I thought it was so fun. Even does it. It says, dark humor is like food. Only some people get it. And why I found that so hilarious is because Stalin, through his tactics and implementation of a command economy was choosing who got food and who didn't. So when we go back to the third question of <clears throat> who is going to get, you know, who is it going to be produced for? Well, whoever the government chose. And in this case, Stalin chose to produce food for only certain people. So there's, I guess you could say that's a flaw too. If you're not the right person in a command economy, you might be out of luck. All right, let's see some more here. Weaknesses of command, traditional, and market. Goodness gracious, you know, man, I even laid out a chart on those review videos that you should probably take a look at. Um, but I'll do it real quick anyway, since you bothered to tune in. Strengths and weaknesses of command. Okay, um, I just did some strength. I'll just go through them again real quick. I, I'm not going to do the traditional one again because I just did that. Um but the command one, we talked about how, in theory, everybody is taken care of. And then I also mentioned something earlier about th that things that aren't profitable, that people need, like maybe some medicines, those would also uh, be ensured that they would be produced. Because um, in a market economy, no one's going to do this. Like, hey, you want to make this product? Yeah, sure. You won't make any money off of it. And you'd probably be like, why am I going to waste my time? And then obviously you wouldn't. Um some other strengths, I'm, some, sorry, I'm sorry, some other weaknesses uh, with the command economy, poor decision making because everything's centrally planned. Um, people are lazy because, you know, we've talked about it before in class. If you knew that you were going to be taken care of, how motivated are you going to be to try and be successful? And it leads to underutilization and wasting of resources. Um, in AP Euro, we talk about how one of the problems with the Soviet Union is people just started showing up to work drunk. Because what you're going to do, you're going to take care of me anyways. That's just how the economy works. 
Um, so there's pretty much strength and weaknesses there. Um, market economy. Okay, so sh let's do market economy. So strengths, you know, we talk about choice. Choice is fantastic. Let's go back to the three questions again. Well, who's going to, I'm sorry, what are we going to make? Whatever you want, that's what you get to make. That's a, the beauty of choice. Um, so I want to circle back to something too um, after this. So it's like, you know, what are you going to make? Well, whatever you want. I mean, this is where some confusion gets in. And I would love to have a discussion with someone who has a really thorough uh, background in economics because, you know, the book tries to argue and tell you that, oh, well, you know, consumers decide what's made. And I can sort of agree with that. I can really see that. But in the end, a producer really decides what's going to be made. It just, it would be really smart if you made something that people wanted. Like, I'm not going to make joke is pink booty shorts for guys. Because while there might be a few guys who like those things, and overwhelmingly, no, probably not. I mean, at least not me. Maybe it's just your generation that likes that type of thing. Um, but I'm not judging. Um, so... You know, in the end, I, I like to make the argument that both consumers and producers decide what's going to be made. Um, but then when you throw the command economy portion in there, too, that would be the government. So, you know, I've kind of tried to tell you uh, that when you see that on a test ever, that you should be picking all three of those because really that's how it works. And if I'm wrong about the producer portion, then, oh, well, I'll be wrong if somebody can prove it to me. Okay, so there's your, oh, some, oh, I forgot, I didn't do the weaknesses. So the weaknesses, too, is that there are no public goods or services. So school, you got to find it, it's basically on your own. And I, I did some review in your textbook, I just thought, found it hilarious, is that even in a pure market economy, you wouldn't even have an army. So you could really see how in, ineffective a pure market economy would be, because the uh, the military is considered a public service. So you would certainly want to have that, especially in a country as big as the United States or even a small country because you want to have the ability to defend yourself. So, all right, marginal cost and marginal benefits. So the one thing that I want you to make sure that you understand that we kept talking about says marginal. I kept saying anytime you hear marginal, talk about one more. So I said, what's the marginal cost and marginal benefit? So the marginal cost, how much is it going to cost me for one more? So if I'm talking about what's the marginal cost of going from one step to the next, I'm not talking about the total cost because like in your decision-making grid, like step two, well, I'm trying to remember, it's like the graded, graded one, D, B, let's just say A, it goes F, D, C, B, A. So if I said, well, what's the marginal cost from going from a D like study time. I wish I, I wish I had a chart in front of me, but I don't. So, oh well. Um, so basically what we have is just count how many more will I have to use when I'm talking about marginal. I don't want total for, for the cost. And then marginal benefit is just like, well, you know, how much will I benefit from, how much will I benefit from that? So like, um, like, for, I'll give you a quick example. I mean, this isn't how it's going to be laid out in a test format, but just to give you a better example of it, what's the marginal benefit of me working one more hour? Um, if I had a $15 an hour job, it'd be easy. The answer would be a marginal benefit would be $15. Like, well, what's your total benefit? Well, how many hours did you work? I mean, that would be the total. So, all right, let's try this. Is it any graphs on the test, like a PPC? or cost-benefit analysis? Yes. Yep, there's a PPC and a cost-benefit analysis. And you've already seen them. I, mean, I'm not, I haven't been shy or lying about them. You'll get PPC questions similar to what you already have had. I mean, there's only three questions like you make on a PPC, right? Like what's efficiency, what's underutilization, and what's... Uh, What's production and possibility? Although there's two more questions I could probably ask. You know, what would cause a PPC to shift left versus shift right? Um, so that would be two additional questions that I could possibly throw out there. But I don't tell you what questions are on there. The max is decision-making grid, things like that. Um, 
you're going to see that again. I just changed the question so that you don't know. I'm like, oh, I remember it was it was this answer the last time I took it. Well, now it's a different question, so you better read the question. <laughs> Mr. St <laughs> yeah, I have that, but I, I I'm not going to sit there and be like doing this. No one can see the the, the Max's decision making grid that you um that you gave me a picture of. Though I do appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, this was wait, it, what does it say? What page that's on? No, you didn't give me a page number. It doesn't matter. It's in your book. If you can do the questions that are already in the textbook um, regarding Max's decision making grid. It, I mean, we did those in class, and I just walked you through them. But if you can do them, you can, you know, at home, you can do them tomorrow. I mean, how much different can I make the question? <laughs> yes, I see a PPC curve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there was some confusion, too, from a student. I don't want to say who they are. But, like, they see an example of a PPC curve, and this one doesn't have a picture or page number on it either. But... It, it, they, it, you know, in the book, it had a, a an A, a B, and a C all pointing to the efficiency line. And then when I threw A, B, and C on your quiz, and they're not all pointing to the efficiency line, they were really confused. So I can see that it's not a big deal. It's just you know sometimes we have to have some clarification. You know, there were things when I took economics back in college where I was I had to think for a second and, and get some help. So it's not embarrassing or anything. Uh, this person, so a centrally planned government is just basically the government making choices for the people. Yes, yes, that's what a centrally planned economy is. Because we talked about how in a command economy, choice is, if it was a pure command economy, choice is really not up to the person. It's always the government. So, I don't have my book. Why does it shift left? That's a, how do you, it's a night before a test. Goodness gracious, no book. I won't tell you who that is. Um, I don't have my book. Okay, so if I, okay, so remember, to shift left, I need less of something. And to, to shift right, I need, it needs to increase. So if I had, you can't get more, like, the book will tell you something like, well, you need to find more of the four factors of production. I'm not really sure how you get more entrepreneurship or less entrepreneurship. I think that's just, that's the one thing that should be constant. Um, what I would do is I would say um, if, you, if, if labor, if you had less labor, then it would shift left because you can't make as much if labor goes down. And then if you got more labor, obviously you'd have more people working and you could shift it to the right. And then the same thing with with capital. If you got your hands on some more capital, it would shift to the right. If somehow capital was taken away from you, it would shift left. And then on natural resources, if there's a shortage, so there's not enough, then you couldn't make as much because you didn't have as many resources. And then if for some reason you got a hold of a lot of resources, you would probably be able to make more. This is going to be the one where I, I don't want to try and be mean, but um, for the individual asking me to explain uh, the circular flow model. I went into detail on that at the very end of the lesson five video that I already posted, and I don't think I can do it any better than that without, you know, uh, without having a picture to use right now. Because I actually put a, a circular flow model on uh, on the the presentation, the video, and, and then start walking through it. So this will be the one where I, I'm actually going to have to try and. Um, redirect you to one of those videos. So I guess it's a good thing I made it because, um, you know, now you can go see it. Can I go over Max's opportunity cost of the three extra hours of study? Well, luckily I have, uh, I have, um, I have Max's opportunity, Max's decision-making grade courtesy of another student. Three hours of extra study. Well, the opportunity cost is all the way to the right. Um, it says it's three hours with friends because what does he have to give up? So, you know, if he's got three hours of friends, three hours of extra study, the next best thing he could have done was three hours with friends. And it just goes the same way down. So benefit is, you know, you see in the benefit in the center, it goes D, C, B, B plus A minus A. So, you know, so if we're looking at, since the question is there, it says, what is Max's opportunity cost of three hours of extra study? I mean, seriously, it's just, 
this is the one that's laughing laughable easy and i'm not trying to make fun of you it's just saying that the answer is right in front of you this is a no thinking question because it tells you what the opportunity cost is it says uh, on the right column opportunity cost this is read from the information about marginal cost on the next page what is max's marginal cost of moving from a grade of b plus to an a minus so how much more is it going to cost him to move from a b plus to an a minus well in this he was at Oh, great. Somebody, police running through my neighborhood. Great. All right. Um, <laughs> so it, it costs, it has four hours of extra study time um, to get to a B plus, And then to get to an A minus, it says five. So it says, what's the marginal cost? Well, the marginal cost is going to be one hour with friends. So pretty easy. Let me get back to here. Um All right. Well, enjoy, Mr. Uh, Steele. And that looks like I, well, I'm out of questions now. So get them in because I got uh, 23 minutes till I shut this thing down. Or if we go a stretch without any questions because I know you don't want to sit here and stare at me. And now, oh, hey, finally got one. Will there be a cost-benefit analysis on the test? I did answer that. I think you probably stepped away. Yes, you'll have something. I mean, you got one on your quiz, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just took the cost-benefit analysis. Well, it says cost-benefit analysis. I mean, you're not going to have to do one yourself. You're going to have to look at someone else's, which would be the Max's decision-making grid. That's him doing a cost-benefit analysis. So, so like I said, if you can analyze a decision-making grid that's in your textbook, then you'll be fine. So, it is on out. Any other questions? I got 15 viewers and no questions pouring in. All right, well, I'll give it two minutes. It's 9.08. I'm going to give it to 9.10. No questions come in, then we're all done. Says, how does opportunity cost factor in the decision making process? Is it because people choose what they want or something? Well, it it all comes down to the benefit. Like for right now, you know, let's you you obviously decided to watch this that the opportunity cost, which is whatever you'd be doing. I'll get yeah, I'll get into. I see the question on utility. You have to wait a second. Because I got a couple of questions ahead of you. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, you're, you're viewing this right now. So there's an opportunity cost here. Because whatever you could have been doing other than watching me on this poorly lit screen, that I'm going to have to find a way to get around next time, um, it's worth it to you. So the whatever the benefit would be. So when we looked at, you know, if you look at Max's decision making grid, if you look at this right now, like from your point of view, it would be you know, like 10 minutes of review with Mr. Norton, 10 minutes with friends or whatever you'd be doing. And then in the center column, you'd be like, well, here's how much I would benefit. Maybe I go from a C to a, we don't have pluses, but maybe I go from a 70 to a 75. And then after 30 minutes of, of viewing Mr. Norton's video, doing review with him, and then obviously 30 minutes of of time with friends would be your opportunity cost but then because you're spending even more time uh with this you are uh you know, your benefit keeps going up so you know that that's basically what happens in your head too i assume is you know when you make a decision it's like man i got all these things i want to do but how do i make the decision well i got to sit there and go well if i make this decision here's what i'm going to give up how am i going to benefit from it if i do that so you know that's what people do then and sometimes, you know, like some people think, well, well, you know, it's all about how much you're going to be satisfied with. Well, 
I mean, are you really, not every decision you make, are you really satisfied with? Like, are you happy with? I mean, there are plenty of things that I do throughout my day that I don't necessarily enjoy, but I know that it's more beneficial to do those things. So like, I'd much rather be at, at home playing with my kids rather than going to work. No offense. I'm sure you'd probably rather be at home than sitting in my classroom. But the benefit that I get from going to work is much better than, in most cases, spending that time at home with my kids. I mean, you know, within reason. So same thing for you. Um, how does utility and incentives influence people's economic choices? So I'm going to actually knock out two questions at once because I have two questions right in a row about utility. The thing that you need to know about utility, what's well, a vocabulary term? It's it's satisfaction. How much satisfaction will you get out of it? Like I said, sometimes satisfaction is the, is the pure driving, motivating factor of why you do something. Um, you know, why did you eat a cheeseburger over a taco? Well, I got more. I thought I'd get more satisfaction out of the cheeseburger, so maybe you do that. So incentives too. Incentives can play a role. Uh, and by the way, we're going to end up getting into talking. You should be because you've read through chapter four. You know, diminishing marginal utility, which whatever we'll we'll wait on that anyways. But incentives. Incentives are things that producers will often try and do in order to get you to do something you wouldn't normally do, like. Um, when you end up seeing a commercial for a car and they talk about all these great deals that they have to, that, you know, like 0% financing, which is very rare these days. I mean, if you can find 0% financing, that is a heck of a deal because that basically is like free money. That's like getting a loan and then for free. I mean, because when you get loans, which we'll talk about later on, is that there's always an interest involved, meaning that if I took a $20,000 loan, and for those of you who are going to be going to college and taking student loans, if you if you borrow fifty thousand dollars, you're not paying back fifty thousand dollars. You're paying fifty thousand dollars plus interest. So in that case, with a zero percent interest, that would be where you just had to pay exactly what you borrowed. So they'd be like, "Man, you know, I wouldn't have really bought that car, but that is one heck of a deal. Zero percent financing, and they'll pay my first two payments and give me oil changes for life. Why well, think I might buy a car now?" Um, buy one, get one free. You know, I've talked about it in class. I wouldn't normally buy a $100 dress shirt. Uh, sadly, yes, that's how much they cost. Um, I don't buy that many, or, or except in this case, because I'm using, I'm actually using real life situation to try and teach this concept. So they'll, they'll end up going, well, if you buy one, you get one free. So I'm like, well, I wasn't going to buy a dress shirt, but if you're going to go ahead and do buy one, get one free. It's like I bought one, you know, this is the right... This is me talking myself into buying the shirt because I have zero willpower when it comes to things like that. It's like, well, I only paid $50 for each shirt and it, it's okay that way because I got two for one. So things like that. But there can be incentives too that can keep you from doing things that um, like they can be punitive. Like say I smoke and uh, this happens a lot too. Now I don't smoke. I'm just saying that in this scenario. And um, so what the state of Michigan has done um, is the state of Michigan is trying to discourage you from smoking. So what they do is they do things like slap a heavy tax on cigarettes. So cigarettes in Michigan are really expensive uh, compared to other states. You know, I have relatives from Kentucky that come up occasionally, and they're just absolutely astonished at how expensive cigarettes are. Um, let's try some other. I mean, there's one thing I was just thinking of in my head. And I just lost it. I was going to be for for incentives and negative and things like that. But, oh, yeah, no, I do. Um, so, like, uh, the city of New York is, um, they're doing things that, uh, they're doing things to try and get people to, to eat healthier. So, like, they're slapping taxes, extra taxes that didn't exist before on things like soda pop. So, if you want a Mountain Dew in the city of New York, and, and I'm pretty sure this is how what they try to do. Now, you know, maybe you have to pay an extra tax. I think they've also done things like uh, pass laws about you can't have, uh, uh, you can't sell sizes over a certain ounce. And so what they're trying to do is get you to not do this. And then normally I would drink a, uh, you know, a tw uh, maybe a, heck, may I, may I, maybe I'll drink a liter of pop. I mean, they used to have those little big slams, whatever, they don't have them anymore. Um, but if you slap a tax on them, maybe I'm like, it's not really worth my, it's not really worth it. So 
again, there it's just a different way of explaining how the government, in this case, it's the government, um, would be trying to get you to do something you wouldn't normally do. But then producers will also try to get you to do things you wouldn't normally do too, like purchase something by making the deal that much better. So those are your two. That's the two right there. Can I describe choice? Sure. It's a decision. That's, that's the best I can do. Choice. But choice is involved in anything. You know, choice. Uh, you're choosing to tune in right now. You're choosing to submit a question. When, uh, But when we talk about it in economics, though, too, is it, it's really about scarcity. I remember scarcity means that I don't have unlimited things. It's... I, I have only so much of it. No, I don't have scared, uh, unlimited money, and neither do you, and and neither do all of our pretend ballers in the classroom. Like, I've got unlimited money. Yeah, sure you do, buddy. Um, so what happens is, is that I have limited resources, but I have unlimited wants and needs. So I have to make choices. I have to make decisions. What do I do with my limited resources? Do I get all my want? Do I just fulfill all my wants? Do I fulfill all my needs? And I, I tried to, I tried to, uh, you know, demonstrate that through that song we played. I cannot remember. I always say Gator Boots, but it's not Gator Boots. I don't remember what the real name of it is. But the guy makes terrible decisions. He doesn't have. He's got a brand new car with bald tires and barely any gas in it, and he dresses well, but. You know, he's talking about all these nice things he has, but it doesn't sound that nice when he also says he doesn't have any money for his rent. So he does a terrible job of making choices to try and balance his wants and needs. So, again, um, you know, that goes back to um, one of your learning targets, how does scarcity affect both consumers and producers, which I hope you know for tomorrow. Right? So producers... You know, as a producer, I can't, I don't have unlimited resources. I can't make every single product that's out there. So I have to figure out with the resources I actually have, what is it that I can make that is going to make me the most money, the most profit? And one of the things we'll talk about later on in the school year is that when things become not profitable enough anymore, I mean, they can still have some profit, but if it's not enough worth my time, I take my resources and I make something else. So, I mean, let's, do an example. Here's the thing I can think of as a PlayStation 3. Sony could still keep making PlayStation 3s, and they still did shortly after uh, PlayStation 4s came out. But at some point, the profits that they were making off of it were so had declined so much that they decided, I'm not going to make PlayStation 3s anymore. I'm just going to make PlayStation 4s. So they were taking the resources that they were dedicating towards PlayStation 3 creations and then flipping it over and just making more PlayStation 4s because it was making them more profit. So that was a choice they had to make. I go back to choice for the consumers. You know, you have to make a choice every time you make a purchase. You know, you're going to fulfill your wants or your needs. How are you going to do that? You know, are you going to buy name brand or are you going to buy inferior goods? Which, you're like, what's inferior good? Well, if, if you don't know what an inferior good is, you probably haven't read Chapter 4. So... Uh, or do I buy a luxury good? So, you know, it, it's all about choice. So, I've got 11 minutes left. <laughs> we either have 11 minutes or two minutes. <laughs> I should have my Tom Ritchie tea glass, right, Krishna? About a minute left. If I don't get any questions, we're going to shut it down a few minutes early, and I guess that's some extra study time for you.
I'll tell you what, to the person who asked me if I could, you asked me if I could email you the learning targets, but you never gave me an actual email address to send them to you. So if you, if you send me a, you can send me a, a message at what email address you'd like me to send it to, and I'll send you a copy before I go to bed, assuming I actually see it before I go to bed. And I'll be going to bed probably about 15 minutes after I turn this thing off. So that's your option right there. When am I check? When are you checking in chapter four and five? You tuned in for that. Okay. Um, well, it was supposed to be today uh, for four at least um, for three of my four economics classes. Um, so what I'll plan on doing as far as that goes is that when we cover section one, I'll check for section one and two when we do two and three when we do three. I only had one class I had to turn in all of chapter four yesterday, uh, yesterday because that was just unfortunately what had happened is they were, you know, asked to do to stop being allowed several times and apparently they needed some extra motivation. Now, had we actually covered chapter four today or at least started with it, um, which you were given the option, we could have started chapter four today. I would have checked today. So that's pretty much how things work. And this has been a really unusual start to the school year um, as far as like pacing. Uh, you know, last year we were we were done way, way before that. Um, for the individual says, people are trying to ask questions on the YouTube chat. I've said it many, many times. I can't see them. All I can see is me. Just like all you can see is me. So, sorry. Differentiate between goods and services. A good is a physical object I can buy, like a phone. A service, which someone even pointed out to me in class, is me. I'm a service. I'm providing a service right now. You can't take me home. I know that's disappointing, but no, you can't take me home. Um, a haircut, you don't take a haircut home you have it performed and then then you go home but you don't actually take the haircut home and then some of you are like might be like well you know i some of the ladies they they come home with some extra hair because of what they have done true uh but you're bringing home the good uh that was put in your hair because of the service so you know like your cable that's considered a service um, if you buy food at the grocery store, that would be considered a good. Your shirt, it's a physical, again, just, it's really easy. Goods are physical objects and services are things that people do for you. So, and I, the thing that I find hilarious, is I have been talking about for at least a week, how I can't see anything in that, in that, in that stream that you're in the, uh, YouTube chat. So... Ah, uh, well, so there's your goods and services. Um, let me see something real quick. No, I can't get to it while I do it this way. And now I've lost where I'm at. Oh, here I am. So we'll see. And the person who asked me for the... Uh, <laughs> to email them still hasn't <clears throat> still hasn't given me the email that I'm supposed to send it to and I know you're on here because you're still asking questions so it'd probably be easier if you just sent me an email and then I could just send it back to you so my email is the letter C and then my last name N-O-R-T-O-N <clears throat> at chandlerparkacademy.net. The problem with that email address is when students normally type it in, they somehow misspell chandlerparkacademy.net. So you're really going to have to make sure that you type in the right word. So let's see if there's anything else. If I got 2x minus 4y, how do I find the slope? Girl, bye. I don't know. I'm not a math major. I'm like I would have a 
I'm not going on my YouTube from my phone and view it. No. How about that? How about you follow directions? That'd be fantastic. Wouldn't it be great if you just follow directions like I told you the first time? If I got 2x minus 4, how do I find a slope? you just trying to get some questions in there so I don't go away. I don't know. I'm sure you can find something on YouTube, though. <laughs> I would go on my phone to look at my stream of me streaming. That would be weird. I'm just not going to do it. I'm just going to say you should have followed directions, like I said. <gasps> Is that an opportunity cost moment? It could be. Hmm. The choice the individual made was to not follow directions, and it, the opportunity cost was having their questions answered. <gasps> Trace Minuen, Trace Minutos. No, I don't speak Spanish, so don't try and get me to help you on that. Usually I speak really bad Spanish, as in I make it up. Okay, well, when I'm done with this in three minutes, I'll try and email you at uh, what you just provided me. Although, with the way you just did this, you probably just let everybody know what your email address is. Not that that's a big deal. I hope you had a printer at home, too, because, you know can't print them out. I guess you could always just write them down on paper, which I would not prefer. The other thing too, ladies and gentlemen, when I talk about with other classes today, you need to have the learning targets, the, the evidence actually put out there. Um, I have had people just put check marks in the boxes and then like, oh, I'm done. I'm like, well, how am I even supposed to know you're a three? You just check the box. And plus, how much effort does that take? You could technically check all threes in probably 45 seconds. But hey, you know. Thing is, is that when I shut this off and and look at the, if I choose to go back and look at the video, I can actually see all the questions that were asked. That's after the fact. I like this format better anyway. I like looking at my phone. And... Um, Tom Ritchie does just the phone. You probably only four people that I have for economics right now even knows who Tom Ritchie is. So, oh, somebody just requested to uh, follow me. Two minutes to one minute to go. All right. Well, hopefully we can get your question answered. Whoever boozy is. And I can't I can't even tell from the, the picture. Not that it matters. Nice homecoming photo though. My dad's name is Tom Ricky. <laughs> Well, that's pretty close, but we're going Tom Ritchie, and if you uh, if you take AP European history, you'll you'll know who Tom Ritchie is. Um, so, like, I I would hope like Tom Ritchie is up here. My hope is that one day I can be like maybe right here. So, like. If, what, <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do this real quick. Whoever Boozy is, is asking me to analyze the characteristics of command economies. I did that a long time ago in this video. So when we're done, you can find it. Actually, yeah, I mean, you could do that. 
or you could, you know, you could look at the video I made of uh, Unit 1, Lesson 4, that pretty much gives you the advantages and disadvantages and tells you how it works. Your choice. So I did talk about in class that I don't answer questions twice through the stream because you can always go back and find them. So hope you find it. Since I have 11 people on, I'll, I'll extend it another five minutes if you really have another question. If not, then uh, I'm going to sign off and get ready for bed. And those of you are like, oh, how are you going to bed at 9.30? Because I get up every morning at 4 in the a.m. So how about that? And I still got to email somebody the learning target sheet because they lost it. Cutting into my sleep. No. And looks like we're about done. All right, well, that's going to be it then because I've got no more questions. Um, remember, it's, it's always nice that uh, if you miss something in this review that we just did, you can always go back and, uh, and skip around in it. So best of luck tomorrow. Um, I don't really believe in luck. I believe you destiny as far as that goes. So the more you prepare, the better you'll be. All right, take it easy. Good night.